Hello, I'm Dr. Manuel G. Saldivar. I'm a cognitive psychologist and a university faculty member. This video is one in a series associated with a textbook by Jeffrey Levy entitled Psychology, the Science of Human Potential. This is a free open source textbook that's available for anyone to use. A link to this textbook can be found below this video in the description box. The purpose of this video is not to cover every single point in the textbook. Rather, it's meant to give students an overview of the contents and the big ideas, the main themes of every particular chapter. So let's get started. In prior chapters of Levy's textbook, we've explored the roots of human behavior that tend to be involuntary or at least outside of our conscious control, such as emotional responses and motivations for behavior. In this chapter, chapter 5, we're going to begin to explore a behavior that not only is usually within our conscious control, but often usually requires that we really pay close attention to what we're doing. And especially be con conscious of the stuff happening in the world around us. And this behavior is learning. Now, Levy defines learning in this chapter as an adaptive process whereby individuals acquire the ability to predict and control the environment around them. Uh, an example is a child walking around um, in the rain. Even if that child doesn't understand the scientific explanation of why it rains, why rain happens, they can learn to associate dark clouds, thunder, um, with a high likelihood of rain. And they prepare for that possibility. They're trying to take some control about what happens to them in the world by taking an umbrella with them to school. So you obviously can't necessarily stop the rain, but you can take steps to minimize the chances of yourself getting wet by taking an umbrella with you if you go out and it looks like it might rain. Learning is a complex topic, so in this chapter we're only going to focus on one particular kind of learning um, that I'm going to call learning as training, uh, that is training to complete, to conduct specific tasks, specific activities. Um, there are two kinds of learning as training and we'll divide them up here as we go through the chapter. The first kind of learning is called predictive learning in Levy's textbook. Uh, other authors, other, other researchers, including myself, um, will probably refer to this predictive learning as classical conditioning. And classical conditioning was made widely known due to the research of a Russian scientist named Ivan Pavlov. Classical conditioning is a process whereby individuals acquire the ability to predict future events and to prepare for those events, the occurrence of them. Um, there are examples given of classical conditioning regarding feeding dogs, because this was a, a technique that was big in Pavlov's research. Um, the basic idea with classical conditioning is when a dog sees food, let's say a nice juicy steak, they have an unconditioned response. Unconditioned just means it's not something they were taught, it's something that's just instinctual. Uh, it's part of biology. Um, when we eat, we need to produce saliva in order to help us uh, consume food and aid in our digestive process. So salivating, or drooling, as it were, um, has a purpose. It doesn't just happen. It happens because it helps us eat. It helps us digest our food. So you show a dog um, a juicy steak. Uh, this is called an unconditioned stimulus. It's just something that's natural in the world. Uh, a steak, meat, food, whatever it is. And the dog will have an unconditioned response, salivating uh, or drooling. Again, this is something that has evolved because it helps dogs, in this case, or other species, survive. Pavlov's research was able to indicate is you can then shift to what's called a neutral stimulus, something that we perceive in the world around us that doesn't have a particular kind of desired outcome or reaction, like ringing a bell. And the test subject, the animal, will show no response because it's just, okay, you're, I, I'm a dog, I'm sitting around you know, in this lab, somebody comes by and rings a bell, okay, they're ringing a bell. I know it's not dangerous, I'm not going to feel you know, uh, afraid or upset, 
it's not a treat. It's not food. Um, so I'm not going to get super excited. Um, but I'm not going to be scared either. It's just a bell. The next step to classical conditioning, as Pavlov demonstrated with his research, was tying together this neutral stimulus with an unconditioned stimulus. So again, to continue with this dog example, um, Pavlov might start to bring out the steak, but at the same time, ring the bell. So the dog starts salivating because it sees a steak. That's the unconditioned response. But over time, and you have to repeat, you know, we repeat this with some regularity for it to really start to have an effect. The dog also uh, associates the ringing bell with being fed this juicy steak. Eventually, if you remove the steak from the equation, if you just ring the bell, the dog has been conditioned, has been trained to associate this ringing bell with being fed. And so even though they're not actually being fed, even though they're not actually getting a juicy steak, they'll start to salivate because that's what you do when you're about to eat. And even though there is a steak there, the bell has become so strongly associated in a dog's mind with being fed, with eating a steak, they'll salivate in response to a steak that isn't there because the bell is kind of standing in for the steak. So that's an example of classical conditioning. The second kind of learning that's discussed in Levy's textbook, uh, he calls control learning. Uh, other researchers, again, and, and other psychologists like myself, will uh, also use the term operant conditioning. And this is based on the research of psychologists Edward Thorndike and B.F. Skinner. So this takes us, Pavlov was operating in the early 1900s uh, through about the 1920s, 1930s. Um, Thorndike and Skinner take us from the 30s, 40s, 50s, all the way up until the 60s. That's when they were doing their research. Operant conditioning is a little more complex, but sort of a roughly similar idea in that you're trying to give some uh, present stimuli to directly influence how people are behaving. Operant conditioning is based on uh, what are called schedules, and you can just think of a schedule as a series of steps or, if you will, a recipe that uh, you follow with the goal of trying to elicit a certain kind of behavior. So you begin with a process of reinforcement that is meant to increase the behavior that's happening, so this reinforcement, your goal, your, your immediate goal is to keep a certain behavior happening. If you want to decrease a certain behavior, if you want uh, the test subject to stop doing or diminish how much they're doing a certain thing, then you would come up with some kind of punishment. So let's look at these separately. Positive reinforcement, you add what the textbook calls an appetitive stimulus an appetitive stimulus is a stimulus, something we perceive in the world around us that we like, that we want more of. So that's an example of trying to teach a dog to sit. If it sits successfully, you give it a treat. The dog likes treats, so it's going to keep trying to sit, to do what, what pleases you, sitting, in order to keep getting treats. That's positive reinforcement. That's a, a way of increasing that behavior of sitting. You can also use negative reinforcement. There are uh, two categories to this, uh, escape and active avoidance. So uh, an example of escape as negative reinforcement, you uh, get up in the morning uh, because your alarm goes off. Uh, You're not super happy about getting up, but you know you have to get up, so you've set your alarm. Um, Removing that stimuli, the ringing of your alarm, by doing what you're supposed to do, is called a negative reinforcement, an escape reinforcement. So again, here you're uh, turning off your alarm clock, or let's say you have an alarm ring on your phone or whatever, you uh, turn off the alarm by hitting the off button or the snooze button. You are doing what you have to do. You're getting up out of bed. You're you're getting woken up because the alarm is ringing. And then you escape that negative reinforcement by, by turning it off. Active avoidance is when you are trying to forestall, to avoid a bad outcome, an undesirable outcome, by taking some action. So uh, the example that's shown here is about getting a bad grade. You uh, have gotten uh, a C on the midterm, and you want to make sure you get at least a B on the final to hopefully help you get a B for the semester in the course, let's say. Uh, One 
way of getting a good grade is kind of crossing your fingers and hoping and wishing that you get a good grade. That may work, but uh, maybe a better approach is to actively do something like studying to avoid getting the bad grade. So that's a kind of negative reinforcement, uh, active avoidance. On the punishment side, there's positive punishment and negative punishment. And I know in everyday English, some of these terms may um, kind of be used in different ways. So it can be a little confusing. But here again, we're focusing on how psychology uses these terms. So a positive punishment would be adding what's called a noxious stimuli, uh, adding some thing that happens that you don't like that this thing is happening. Uh, for example, uh, some parents may spank their children if they do something like uh, cursing or using inappropriate language. Um, getting spanked is not a positive thing per se, but that's not how we're using that term in this context. Right? We're talking about positive punishment, positive as in you're adding something you, you, uh, you know, just like a plus sign, you're adding something to the equation, in this case spanking, to try and apply some kind of punishment to the situation in order to get a child, in this case, to stop doing something. The other kind of punishment, again, with an aim towards decreasing a certain kind of behavior, is a negative punishment, and that's where you remove something desirable, you remove a reward, in order to decrease behavior. So uh, let's say again, same situation, a child is using inappropriate language. You may decide instead of spanking them because you're against uh, spanking, uh, uh, corporal punishment, whatever, you decide, okay, I'm not going to spank this child because that's not something I, I choose to do as a parent. But there's got to be consequences for uh, cursing, for using inappropriate language. So instead of being able to sit around with the rest of the family and watch TV, they're going to send be sent to their room, uh, no TV, no internet. That would be a negative punishment. Again, in predictive learning, which would be uh, classical conditioning in uh, our example, there's usually a connection between some biologically significant stimulus, like food or um, feelings of shock, negative emotion, uh, and the response being studied, salivation or an increase in heart rate. Uh, there's an example in the reading about uh, electrical shock and heart rate. If uh, that seems familiar to you, you can review that in the textbook. So predictive learning um, or classical conditioning, the the major variables, the, the relationship, the connection between the stimulus and the response is rooted ultimately in some kind of biological relationship. In control learning or operant conditioning, as I'm going to call it, the connection between the response and the stimulus is much more arbitrary. There's not necessarily a natural real-world connection between the response and stimulus, but what matters is being able to create this schedule of reinforcement to increase behaviors you want to increase, you want to become more prevalent, and again, using a schedule of reinforcement to decrease behaviors that you want to diminish or try and reduce the number of. For example, and the textbook goes in more detail about this if you want to kind of uh, review it. There's not a genetic relationship between completing a maze or pressing a bar, as rats are often taught to do in different kinds of studies. Um, complete a maze, you get a treat, um, press this bar in your, in your cage, um, and the bar just kind of uh, collects, records an, an electrical signal. Um, that's not necessarily stuff that rats do in the wild. It's not something they've evolved to do. But, in contrast, uh, there is a genetic relationship, there is an element of heredity in the example about Pavlov's research, um, where, again, you show a dog a juicy steak, they're going to start to salivate because that aids in digestion, um, so there's a reason why you salivate when you're shown a steak. And, of course, uh, showing or putting a rat in uh, a maze or getting it to do some kind of uh, pressing of a bar in its cage, you can train the animal to do that, but they're not kind of falling back on natural behaviors. It's uh, a behavior that is entirely taught to them uh, and they're sort of forced to do by the situation the circumstances they're in. At the heart of operant conditioning, again, this is the B.F. Skinner, uh, uh, Edward Thorndike school, of uh, also called control learning in Levy's text, um, you have this series of rewards and punishments that are meant to shape behavior. The roots of classical and operant conditioning go back more than a century by this point. But the main takeaway that I want you to have from this chapter 
is that we tend to think of learning in the sense of learning in school, formal schooling, formal education. But it's important to remember that a lot of learning is really training to perform specific tasks. And that learning can happen in ways that often are outside of our conscious attention. Nonetheless, they are very important to who we are, to our ability to survive as human beings. We'll dig more into this concept of different kinds of learning in the next chapter. That concludes today's video. I hope you've found this overview helpful for your own studies. Please don't forget to like and subscribe if you found this video useful. It really helps my YouTube channel grow. Good luck with your continuing studies of psychology as well as with the rest of your college career. Take care.